the dramas that World War II had uh, legated to, to Europe as a continent. And in, in a famous speech that he delivered in the University of Zurich in 1946, he said that he was convinced that in order to avoid uh, the repetition of what uh, had happened between 1939 and 1945 in Europe, uh, a kind, and I'm quoting, a kind of United States of Europe were needed. And, uh, and in 1948, in The Hague, a Congress that is known as the Congress of Europe, a Congress took place where ideas, uh, uh, future visions uh, of, uh, for the continent um, after World War II were developed, were discussed, and the European movement was established as a kind of a permanent secretariat of that Congress with a mission to, uh, to make uh, uh, the, to implement the conclusions of the Congress. And at that time, conferences were very, were very successful and very efficient because um, the, the, the movement was established in the, in the 25th of October of 1948, and in the 5th of May of 49, so uh, roughly six months later, uh, the Treaty of London was, was signed, establishing the Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe was established following exactly the, the, the propositions of, uh, of, the, of the Congress of Europe, which were to, 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 to create a structure where uh, governments could cooperate through what is now in the Council of Europe the Committee of Ministers, where peoples could cooperate uh, through what is the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and that this union of uh, peoples and, uh, and states in Europe would, would, was to be based on principles and values that are, uh, uh, that are of course, enshrined in the, in, the, in the Cultural Convention of the Council of Europe and implemented through the European Court of Human Rights. So, um, as I said, very efficient, six months later, something happened that materialize some of the ideas of the European movement in, uh, uh, developed in 1948. One year later, in 1950, Robert Schuman, who was uh, with one of our former presidents, uh, uh, Robert Schuman made his famous declaration inviting Germany to, uh, on behalf of France to, to share the management of, uh, of the um, coal and steel which were obviously the materials that were needed for weaponry to be uh, built and therefore for wars to be fought. And, and, and he thought that by doing this, by having a, a co-management of these materials, wars would be avoided because, of course, uh, especially between France and Germany, which were the, the big enemies in Europe for, for centuries, um, if, uh, of course, if, the, if these materials were to be used, uh, war was to be prepared, the other, the other part would know. Um, and, of course, this led in 1957 to the, to the signature of the Treaty of Rome that uh, led to what is today the European Union. I'm saying all this not because I, thought, I think that you don't know, but because I wanted to, to make the point that uh, this exercise of imagining the future um, very often works. And very often, uh, uh, as, uh, as Alexander was telling us yesterday, this discussion about the future and the present and so on, I mean, the truth is that very often ideas, ideas can be materialized if there's a group of people who have the, the drive enough to make, to make it happen. And at that time, between 48 and 57, there was obviously uh, a good motivation because people still had fresh in their memories what they had been through uh, during World War II. But there was also leadership that was responsible enough and, uh, um, to, to make things happen. Um, and some, sometimes we complain that uh, we no longer have these kind of leaders. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I wanted to make sure that people understand that this all started because in 1948, around 700 people from different places in Europe came together in The Hague and discussed, like in, in a meeting like today, uh, what they wanted Europe to look like in the future. And the European movement has changed, as Europe has changed over these last 66 years, of course. Uh, 
but it has remained uh, faithful to, to, to a couple of things that for, our, for us are is essential and in a way uh, make us still be the, the same organization that we were in 1948. And these two things are of course the idea. We still believe that the United Europe will be uh, um, better equipped to deliver to the citizens of Europe what the citizens of Europe want, and the citizens of Europe does, don't want very different things from the citizens of other regions in the world. They want to live in peace, they want to, 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 to have an environment that allows them to, to, to pursue happiness for themselves and for their, for their children, and they want to be uh, able to prosper in, in the different uh, domains that they have uh, decided to, to commit uh, their efforts to. Um, and the second, and the second uh, line of force and when we want to remain faithful to is to keep being a movement of civil society. Today, the European movement is a federation, if you want to put it this way, it's a federation of 76 civil society organizations in Europe. Um, we, are, we are structured through what we call national councils, working at the national level and uh, engaging with citizens and civil society organizations at the national level in, uh, in 41 countries in Europe. And we do have also what we call international associations, so associations working already themselves at the European level. So 76 of these organizations have come together and keep working uh, on the day-to-day -day basis through this perspective of civil society, mobilizing the citizens at the national level, at the local level, um, to bring their message to the European level and keep progressing in this process that is normally known as European integration, but at, at, uh, at, at the end of the day is uh, about uniting, uniting the peoples and the countries that uh, conform Europe. The values that we, that we promote, because we are a movement of civil society, are, are very simple to explain, maybe more complicated to make, uh, uh, to live through on a day to day basis, but very simple to explain. We do believe that the uh, unity of Europe won't be, uh, cannot take place and cannot be developed without the people's consent. And therefore, one of the major, one of the major uh, areas of our work is to make sure that the, the transnational structure uh, that, or the transnational structures that contribute to the unity of Europe, be it the European Union institutions or the work of the Council of Europe or the OS, OSCE, etc., etc., are based on uh, the people's control, on the democratic control. And therefore we work a lot for building, for developing, for deepening a transnational democracy. And we are very proud that the EU has developed in this direction not perfectly, uh, no, we are very critical <laughs> of that indeed, but, but it has developed in this direction, starting with a parliamentary assembly made of, of parliamentarians elected at the national level, then coming up with a parliament, European parliament that is directly elected by the people, and as you know, for the first time this year, uh, the president of the commission was elected in a process where actually different personalities from different political parties uh, fought for the votes of people, and uh, Mr. Juncker, who was one week uh, ago, uh, took, place, took uh, office as president of the European Commission, is the first president of the European Commission who will actually run uh, an election and, 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 and ask for the votes for the people. So we are going in this direction. Also, with, uh, with development, very interesting developments as uh, the European Citizens Initiative is, to which uh, one million citizens in Europe from at least seven member states of the EU can actually sort of propose uh, uh, legislative initiatives to the, to, the, to the Commission, and so on and so forth. But of course, there's much, much more to, to do with that. Then, of course, the issue of, uh, of freedoms and the respect for human rights, so that the Cultural Convention of the Council of Europe is still the blueprint for us, and the idea that, uh, that individuals, that the citizens, that European citizens are to be respected in their citizenship rights wherever they are in the European space. The freedom of mobility, of course, we mentioned that yesterday also. Is it possible to live in a world without borders? Well, in the EU, we live in a, in a world without borders already. Uh, also, including some countries that are not part of the EU, 
like Norway or Switzerland, where there is also this freedom of mobility. Well, with Switzerland, uh, things seem to be changed after the referendum last year. But there, 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 there are other, other developments that are positive also with other things. And of course, the rule of law. Very important. Uh, we, we need to be able, if we, if we are to be free to move and to go and live in another country and work in another country, we need to be assured as a citizen that not only our rights will be respected also there by that state, but also that that state operates in the same respect for the rule of law as, 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 as ours do. So, um, at the end of the day, what, what I wanted to say today uh, in terms of this future vision uh, brought in by the European movement is that, and you know, uh, we are not in a European context here, we are, you are, we are in a world context, but of course the ideas that led in 1948 to the establishment of the, of the European movement of bringing Europe unite, to, to unite Europe is not something that works only for Europe. And at all, already in 1948, the people who engaged in this process thought that a united Europe would be an example for other regions of the world to unite uh, along the same lines. And why not for the world one day to unite along the same lines? So in our, in our vision, what we would like the EU to be, the Council of Europe to be, is indeed a blueprint for, for, uh, for regional and for world integration in the future. A world without borders, where people are free to move without the need to apply for a visa, where people can seek for a job where their skills are require, required and not where they can go because of administrative burdens. That people can live with whoever they, they have chosen to because, uh, uh, because they are in love and they want to have a joint project rather than because of their citizenship or their religion or whatever. A world where people can, can actually uh, care about each other and therefore put away the put away, put aside, totally aside, the even remote possibility of going to war with each other. Um, and this is, this is indeed the achievements that we have to, 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 to share with the world from the 65 years experience in Europe. Um, I, I, I wanted to, to, to touch uh, on, a, on two issues that have been raised yesterday uh, that are very, very, uh, very dear to our hearts also in the European movement. I was not planning to do that, but since they were discussed yesterday, I thought that I would say something about it. One has to do with, uh, um, with this relation between the different uh, governance levels. I mean, very often people tell me, well, isn't it, um, when, when you create a united Europe, when you invest, for instance, in, in the European Union as a, pro a process, as a governance process, is, aren't we kind of... Uh, um, declaring null and void what we have built in the nation states. Aren't we creating a governance level that is very far away from the citizens? And for us, I mean, in the European Union, this is exactly the opposite. What we see today in the world is that it's the, the different layers of government, if I may uh, characterize them as local, national, and, and transnational, it's a bit like an, uh, an hamburger. You know, you have... Uh, you have the, the, the local and the transnational, which are the pieces of bread, and then you have the meat at the national level. Except that, as also what Thomas said yesterday, um, this hamburger is getting less and less meat. You know, there's, there's a lot of very big issues, like climate change, or the fight against terrorism, or the security there that is no longer possible to, to determine at the national level, and for which you need a transnational cooperation, and then there's a lot of issues that people want more and more to have solved at the closest level to themselves. I mean, there's a lot of things that are now dealt with by the national level that need to be given back to the, to the cities, to the neighborhoods. I mean, who cares? I mean, if, uh, what are the rules at the national level for, I don't know, uh, garbage collection. What is important is that at the level of the city you are able to come up with solutions, engaging the citizens of that city in the problems that concern them. Which means that at the national level is getting less and less importance. It's, it's probably seen as a drama by some. For us it's not necessarily a drama, it's just part of an evolution. This doesn't mean that nations will cease existing. It's not about that. 
And that's why I, I wanted to start with a, with a little anecdote about being Belgium or Portuguese. It's not about that. I, I will still be Portuguese whatever happens, and no matter how many years I live in Belgium. But I am committed with my community in Belgium now. So. And that's, that's where I want to play, be able to play a role too. And of course then, I am a citizen of the world, like any of you. And we share some concerns that we need to tackle together. So, you know, the, 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 I don't see a contradiction between, you know, Catalonia wanting to become independent and at the same time wanting to invest more in deeply in the European integration process. I don't see a contradiction, as I don't see a contradiction for myself or for my little daughter, who is uh, a daughter of a Portuguese and an Armenian being born and raised in Belgium. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud that uh, she, she's, now that she starts saying her first words, she says words in four different languages, and sometimes we have difficulties in trying to understand what she means. Um, but, you know, she will probably uh, grow up being a much better human being than I, than I had the chance to. And the second thing that I wanted to say is about also another issue that was raised yesterday, which is the power of corporations. And this is, especially after the financial crisis and the banking crisis that we had in Europe, this is really one of the main motivations for many people in Europe to restart believing in the European project. Because, you know, some corporations, namely some financial corporations, have become too big to be controlled by national states. You know, that, that's, Portugal is not able to control the, 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 the action of some financial institutions in Portugal anymore. It's just not possible. They are too big. And therefore, citizens need to be, to have, to be able to rely in a state that can still face up to to big corporations. So again, there is a need for a renewal of our governance that demands a much deeper transnational cooperation based on the citizens, not based on the states purely, based on the rights of the citizens to be able to face some of the challenges and namely the challenges posed by big corporations that operate freely in the world. Money can flow freely in the world. Why should not people be able to feel for, to flow in the same way? So these were two things that uh, were motivated by the discussions yesterday. I hope I hope you have uh, been able to, to to see a bit uh, uh, the future from uh, from the perspective that we see it, and uh, and I hope that you somehow can share our vision and work together with us on this. Thank you very much.